Namaste. So what's going on here? What's going on on this channel? What just happened? Does anybody know? <laughs> I do, but it's hard to explain. I made a jump. A hyperspace jump. A direct shortcut through space and time from one dimension of thinking to another dimension of thinking assisted by none other than the goddess herself in the form of her mercy her medicine her sacrament huh? try to pay attention to what's going on here because it's something I've always done, but always tried to, how can I say, moderate the effects on others by creating smooth transitions. And in this case, I didn't do that. I just jumped. <laughs> so what is it with the I Ching and all this? Why isn't anybody responding? with meaningful comments referencing the content of the video. Well, I sort of just threw I Ching into the mix here, but actually it's been a part of my life for like 50 years, since like 1966, 67. So for me, it's nothing new. It's always where I've gone to get a view on difficult questions, at least difficult for human intelligence. And what I've done is <clears throat> invoke Shakti, invoke the goddess, and allow her to speak through the change that is throwing the I Ching coins. A change is always a chance. There's some random, randomity or uh, random calculations involved. It has to be that way because all of our systems of representation, all of our symbols, all of our metaphors are incomplete and wrong basically, <laughs> because they rest on the assumptions that the world is real and the body is the self and the mind is operating by logic. <laughs> no, no, that's not true. The mind operates through what's called an associative tree. In other words, things that we experience now are classified and compared to earlier experiences. Why? Because the more they match, then by inductive reasoning, we can predict the future, <laughs> except that it's always wrong. <laughs> it's wrong because we're using symbols. And our reasoning, though it may be perfectly logical, in the world of symbols is not correct in the real world, which is non-logical, non-verbal, non-symbolic, multidimensional, complex, irreducibly complex. And the whole idea of science is to use uh, reductivity, reductionality, or reductionism to simplify things, which gives us the very comforting illusion that we understand them. But we don't, 
because in order to reduce the explanation to its simplest terms, we have to throw out all the things that are important, like consciousness, personality, individuality, will, desire, luck, karma, and so many other things. The will of God, I mean, what formula, what scientific formula takes account for that? <laughs> but we can talk to God. We can talk to goddess, actually, because she is the part of God that is manifest and willing to chat. If we use her tools, and she gives in the scriptures, she gives so many tools, so many methods to contact her. Plus, when she is pictured with uh, enough arms, <laughs> One of them is always holding a cup of wine. Now, in the old days, I mean, even as, as recent as Roman times, wine was used to preserve the mushrooms. And this was a part of the Roman mysteries and the Greek mysteries, especially the Eleusian mysteries and many others. I don't know enough about history and paleontology and all that to trace the roots of all of these lineages. But up until the Roman time, up until Christianity, basically, up until the era of the Abrahamic religions, let's say, wine always or f most frequently meant mushrooms. And it was very high test stuff. According to the Pliny and, and other historians, it had to be diluted many times before it was safe to drink. Otherwise, I don't know what could happen. But actually, you know, the mushrooms are very non-toxic. The toxicology studies done on the psilocybe cubensis show that you'd have to eat literally a barrel of the stuff you know, for it to make you sick. But mental toxins are another matter. And this is what the mushrooms do. They flush out mental toxins. A mental toxin can be a wrong assumption. You know, assume the earth is flat or assume <laughs> that, you know, anything else that's not true. Uh, is true, and that's a mental toxin. It's an untruth, or it's a misunderstanding of the truth, a misunderstood term or symbol, even. So the mental toxins that come up when one first does the mushroom are the things that people are afraid of, that they don't want to experience, that they've been repressing, uh, but it's been eating away at them inside all that time. So I came into that kind of state just the last few months. And I started to feel like, wait a minute, something's off. And every time I sat down to do a video, I had to like cringe. Something was wrong. And I had to go back to first principles. And rethink everything from zero to find out what it was, because it was very deep. It was this assumption that I talked about in the last video about reductionism, that we are so trained up in the West in this reductionistic method. And I was trained up because I was a physics prodigy and I was thoroughly trained in experimental method and stuff like this. And this is all reductionism. So I inadvertently went along with this assumption in studying the various spiritual paths and presenting them also. 
this unspoken, even unthought, but just assumed notion that there is one end, there is a terminal state, there is a final, conclusive uh, attainment, spiritual uh, knowledge or whatever, uh, that is basically permanent. And that's it. So this assumption, of course, is spread throughout every path and every religion and every view, every subject, every topic, every school, that there is a final destination. And, of course, that may symbolize death because death is the final destination, at least as far as we know. See, because if we're really honest, we have to admit, we don't know what lies beyond death. And all of our theories are just guesses. What we would like to lie beyond death. And all our religions are an attempt to make a deal with God to go to the place of where we want to go, that, that made up place, that imagined place, uh, or maybe half remembered place from the ancient days when humanity was young. So looking at religion then through the lens or in the context of the realization that this is simply an assumption. This is simply a carryover of our reductionistic ways into areas where it doesn't really apply. I see everything very differently. And so I've been trying to explain. <laughs> because context determines meaning. We've been over this point since the very beginning of this channel. And when you recontextualize something, it often brings out different aspects of its meaning that we couldn't see before. And the example I always give is school. When you go to school, you're taught to assume this is about education, but it's not really about education. <laughs> when you hold in the context of education, school seems funny somehow. It doesn't really fit right. It isn't really all about education at all, is it? It's really about social training. It's really about culturalization, cultural conditioning. And when we hold it in that context, it makes a lot more sense. That's why there's so much bullying in school. The teachers are bullying the students. The students are bullying the younger students. The administrators are bullying the teachers and the politicians are bullying the administrators, telling them what to teach and what not and so forth. So the whole thing is set up merely to train us in obedience and acceptance of authority and to see our own identity in terms of class and grades and these symbols, huh? these artificial divisions. So in the same way, when we regard this uh, attempt at closure, you know, this attempt at finality, uh, this attempt at reducing everything to the simplest possible explanation, you know, to simply accept that God did it, is, you know, a good excuse for not thinking. <laughs> but the truth is, we don't know. And all of our wonderful stories about it are just theories. And in many cases, we'll never know where we came from, how the world was created, you know, the purpose of existence and all of these huge, huge questions. We may never know with any degree of certainty. 
the, the real answer to these questions because they invoke contexts that are beyond us, bigger than we can imagine, huh? bigger than we can imagine. So if we can't imagine it, we can't conceive it. If we can't conceive it, we can't really think about it because a conception or a theory is an open-ended thought. So in this way, we exit the realm of supposed closure and finality given by these stories based on reductionism. And we enter the world of the goddess where everything is relative and nothing is ever finished, nothing is ever closed, nothing is ever decided fully for good. Huh? She's a woman, she can always change her mind. <laughs> but beyond the joke, she's just playing. She is not run by reason or logic. She just does whatever she feels like. Huh? It's her hobby. And Shiva indulges her because he likes to be entertained. That's all. So anything that we think we know is likely, or more than likely, almost certain to be simply a metaphor for some reality, a symbol for some reality that is actually inexplicable and inconceivable. But it is experienceable. And that's why all the different methods of the path, including the wine of the goddess, <laughs> that good old mushroom wine, <laughs> these are sacraments that are available to us so that we can do the jump to change our being. Because if we do it one step at a time, it's just going to take forever. It's not going to happen. We need the hyperspace jump to actually attain the highest states of consciousness. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti. Aum.